All right, is that better? All right, thank you for pointing that out. I thought you were just waving at me. So our title today, Say Unto This. Say Unto This. Now, you're fine. Come right in. Good to see you guys. The, the title may not grab you, but I believe as we read through the scriptures, you will see the significance and the idea behind the title. We're actually going to read two passages of scripture. One is found in Matthew chapter 17, and the second one is found in Mark chapter 9. They're both describing the same event. Matthew gives more of a snapshot, more of just a summary. Mark gets into a little bit more detail. So we're going to read both passages. So we'll begin with Matthew chapter 17 and verse 14. Everything okay? Okay, is it recording still? Are we still going there? Okay. Uh, could be the internet. Hopefully it will, it will come through. Uh, Johnny, you have any words of insight for this? Say unto this. <laughs> Amen. You caught the meaning of the title. All right, so let's begin in Matthew chapter 17. And when they were come down to the multitude, now bear in mind here, the uh, Jesus and three of the apostles, Peter, James, and John, had been up on a mountain, a high mountain, and it was there where Jesus was the scripture call, or describes it, he was transfigured before them. In other words, all the deity within him just shined out. And it was a glorious uh, experience for the, uh, the three uh, apostles there. And they come down from that mountaintop experience. You ever had a mountaintop experience? You ever been on top of the mountain? Everything's going great? Well, they come down from the mountain. And so verse 14. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him, to Jesus, a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is, and the King James simply says, a lunatic. In other words, he had some mental things going on. And sore vexed, for oftentimes... He falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, the other nine that were down at the valley, or not on the mountaintop. I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Verse 17, Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. Bring the son. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, verse 20, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain. Say unto this mountain. Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Verse 21, how be it, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Now that's the summarized version. Let's go to Mark 
chapter 19, and we're going to begin with verse 14. Mark chapter 19, verse 14. Chapter 9 and verse 14. And when he came to his disciples, again the same thing, they'd come down from the mountains. And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them. Now Matthew kind of leaves that out. So here you get a little better picture of the scene. They come down from the mountain, this huge multitude of people around, and his disciples, the nine, in the midst of all that, and the scribes, the religious leaders, are arguing with them and questioning them. Verse 15, And straightway or immediately all the people, when they beheld him, when they saw Jesus, were greatly amazed and running to him saluted him. I don't think it was that kind of a salute, but they honored him. And he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? What, what, what's going on? Verse 17, again, one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit, and whithersoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and again they could not. Verse 19, he answered and said unto them, he answered him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. They brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit. So now we know it's it's not a mental situation, it is a demon spirit. And they brought him and unto him, and when he saw him straightway, immediately the spirit tear him. And he fell down on the ground and wallowed, foaming. And, his, and he asked his father, Jesus asked his father, verse 21, How long is it ago that this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And the father continued, And oft times it casteth, it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. Isn't that amazing? What a horrible, horrible uh, situation the father was facing in the son. And the father says, But if thou canst do anything, if you can do anything, I brought him to your disciples, they couldn't do anything. If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said unto him, verse 23, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said, unto, said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried, and rent him sore, tried to tear him apart, and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was coming to his, into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? And again, verse 29, Jesus said, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. So you see the full account as we bring Luke, or pardon me, Matthew and Mark's account together. You see. More of the situation, more of the scene that's going on there. Now I want you to think first of all about the disciples for just a moment in this situation. If you remember, and this is recorded in the Gospel of Luke, not long prior to this event, a while back, Jesus had sent not only the 12 apostles out, but he had sent 70 out two by two, to go into the neighboring towns to share the gospel message, to tell them about Jesus, to tell them about repentance, that God was bringing life and salvation to them. And they did. They went out. And when they returned to Jesus, he asked them, how did it go? And if you remember, if you read that account there, they came back and, and in essence they said, wow, 
It's amazing what God has done through us. And we've reached people, we've touched people, and demons have been cast out, and all kinds of things have happened by the power you gave to us. And now they come to this situation. Jesus and three of the apostles are up on the mountaintop. These other nine are here. The crowds are gathering around. They don't know what's going on. They understand something's taking place up on that mountain. And this one father brings his son to these nine apostles and says, here's my problem. Now, Granted, they probably looked back and said, well, God has used us to heal people. He's used us to uh, cast out demons. We're going to do this again. You know, sometimes, thank God, we have some past experiences in our lives where God has blessed us and used us. Thank God for that. Those are learning experiences. Those kind of increase our faith and they, they help us to look out into the lives of others and how can we help them? What can we do to benefit them? No doubt that's what these disciples were thinking. I don't think they were proud and boisterous. I don't think they were depending on themselves. But they realized God has used us and so they seek to cast out this demon out of this young boy. But the scripture says, from the Father's words, they could not. Now certainly that brings a thought to our minds. What about the things you and I experience every day in our lives? And the difficulties that we have, we've had past experiences and God has blessed us through them. Now we come to something new and it's not something that falls before us sometimes very easy. It doesn't just get out of our way. It doesn't change. And it, just like the disciples, it makes us stop and think. Now when they couldn't cast out this demon, here were the religious leaders, the scribes, and all of a sudden they jump on this and they, they start arguing with the disciples and questioning them and what are you doing? And I thought you guys were on top of things. I thought this Jesus was the man and, and what's the problem here? I can only imagine the things that these religious leaders were demanding of these guys. And here comes Jesus down to the valley or down off the mountain and he hears all this he sees all of this and he knows what's going on but for everybody else's sake he says basically what's happening and of course the father comes on the scene and describes the situation and uh I want you to see this scene now with Jesus present from the standpoint of the crowd, the, the scribes, the religious leaders, from the standpoint of the father and the son, and then from the standpoint of the disciples, they're all about to learn something. Isn't that good about God? If you, if you look to Him, if you seek Him, if you come near Him, you know what? You're going to learn something. You're gonna, you're gonna, and sometimes we don't want to learn. Have you ever had those experiences? But they're all going to learn something. So immediately, his words are, and this seems almost out of, out of character, and especially out of sync with the situation. But his first words, after hearing the father, father, after hearing the problem, and after realizing or hearing the statement the disciples could not, Jesus makes the statement, this is in both uh, gospel accounts, he says, he answers, and this is to all. O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. What, what, a, what a powerful statement. Obviously, this was to the multitudes. It was to the scribes but he calls them a faithless generation. And I believe in, in Matthew, he adds a, another thought with this. 
a faithless and perverse generation. What, what a statement. Now everybody heard that. The disciples heard it. The Father heard it. The scribes heard it. The multitudes heard it. I think that statement was to put everybody on point. There's something all of us need to think about. Now, <clears throat> what, what do you think about your generation? What do you think about our generation? You remember, uh, wasn't it Tom Brokaw that wrote that book about the greatest generation, referring to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the soldiers especially and uh, others back home during World War II? I believe that's who wrote that book. He called them the greatest generation. They, it was amazing what all of that generation did working together. What about you, you know? I remember years ago, I was talking, not too long ago, I was talking to a lady one day, and, uh, <clears throat> and she was close to 60, uh, and what have you, or near there, 55, 60. And I was just going on, and I said something about the, uh, the Woodstock generation, the hippie generation, and the long hair and the braids and the, the, the flowers and all of that. And she said, I was part of that. <laughs> I looked at her and I thought, you got to be kidding me. Well, she certainly didn't look like that. So, you know, that, that, was, that was kind of my generation, you know. Uh, uh, all of that, the, the hippies, the, the, all of that going on. Uh, Woodstock, any of you here at Woodstock? Dick, did you go? No? Okay. Yeah. I don't even remember Woodstock. I mean, I didn't even know Woodstock was a thing until probably 20 years after it. You know, that's how shy and how uh, backward that I was. So, uh, uh, Henry, uh, did you and Wayne have the long beard, uh, the long braided? Watch it. <laughs> <laughs> no flowers, not, 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 okay, all right, I just, just check and just want to make sure. But you know, how would we characterize our generation today? How would we characterize our leaders? How would we characterize the people in office across our nation today? I wouldn't characterize them with great descriptions of grandeur, that's for sure. So every generation is different. And Jesus points out to these people, even the religious leaders, there's a faithlessness among you. There's a lack of believing among you. And he wants to get all of their attention. And you know, even as a child of God, even as a believer, I need to hear that once in a while. I need to think, am I part of a, in some way, is there some unbelief within me? So that's what he said to the religious leaders. Now, to the Father and the Son, the fa Father, he's talking to him, and the Father simply cries out to Jesus, Help me! Jesus says to him, if you believe, he, the Father says, if you can do anything, I'd appreciate anything. And Jesus says, if I can do anything, he said, if you believe, all things are possible. And the Father says probably what every one of us feel from time to time. He said, I believe. I believe in you. I believe you can do a miracle. I, can do you, I believe you can do great things. I believe God. I believe God is in control. I believe God is in control of this world. This is my Father's world. I believe that God is all-powerful, that He is a God of healing. But help my unbelief. I don't care who we are. That faith has its moments that, for some, that faith has its moments that there's questions. There's doubts. Yes, I believe in all of the things that I just said. But when I'm faced, and maybe when you're faced with that mountain, 
then that really gets down inside me to who I really am. And it brings out any doubts. It brings out any question. Not that I don't believe. Not that I'm, uh, you know, in that category. But, but, oh, sometimes as a human being, we struggle with those things. And the Father was just being honest. Somebody that says to you, man, I believe and I don't care what happens. I'll never doubt. I'll never question. I, I'm sold out to God. Back off and look out because they may not be as sold out to God as they think they are. But that person like this father that says, Lord, I believe in you and I'm trusting you. I'm just a little nervous. I'm just a little concerned. I'm just a little scared. That's what he said to the father. Now, the disciples. So they come to him after all of this, after Jesus heals the boy, they come to him and they, they simply said, and, and Matthew gives the shorter version here, they said, why could, in verse 19 of Matthew 17, they said, why could not we cast him out? They saw Jesus do this. They saw this young man. The, <clears throat> the demon leaves him. Jesus reaches down, grabs him by the hand, and he stands up. Normal as anything. And they look at themselves and they look around and, and, and they had faith, they believed, they, they hadn't done anything that they had not done when Jesus set them out, sent them out earlier. And they just said, why could we not do this? And so he replies, Matthew, the very first part here, verse 20, Matthew 17, 20, Jesus says, it is because of your unbelief and they said, well, we did believe. So let's go a little further. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed. And <clears throat> I, don't know how, uh, I don't know how else to uh, put this or explain it. It's not the amount of faith it's not, wow, I'm just bubbling over with faith. One, it's who that faith is in. Is it in God? Is it in the Lord Jesus? And two, is it a vibrant, living faith? doesn't have to be huge amounts. You don't have to just feel like you're walking on the water all the time and you're floating on clouds because I've got so much faith. That's not it. Is that faith alive? And he uses the seed, mustard seed, a tiny seed. He uses that seed. Now, we, I've talked about this before, but it's always amazing to me. You take an old, dry, pinto bean that you're about to cook for dinner, but you can take that dry, pinto bean that's probably been in that bag for over a year and you can go out and you can plant it in the ground, pack a little dirt around it, maybe water it a little bit, and in just a few days, if you watch, you'll see that sprout break through the ground. I don't know if you've ever done gardening and stuff like that, but I, I haven't in years, but what I did, I love to go out, and no matter what seed I'd planted, to look at it, as it was starting to break through that ground. It would crack that dirt open, and you, you'd see that dirt cracking, come back maybe the next day, you'd see just that little sprout just, just poking up out of the ground. And I know you've probably seen this, but I've literally seen weeds, weed seed, <laughs> that they came out, they paved the road with asphalt, probably three or four inches thick, and I've literally seen weeds work their way, that sprout, and poke up through that asphalt. Now you talk about power. That little old seed, that little old thing that you think is dead, <clears throat> and put in the ground, and germinates, and it's able to break through not only dirt, but asphalt, and grow up through that? Is that not amazing? 
That's the kind of faith Jesus says that we need. And that's for all of us. It is a living faith. It is not something dead. It's not based on the past. God's done this. I believe He can do this. It's simply based on God. And that God is in control of our lives. And if it's the will of God, this will happen. And that's what I'm believing in. And that's what you all of us need to believe in in our lives because there's lots of mountains out there. There's all kinds and Jesus says there are those times in our lives that we simply need to say to this mountain, to this problem, to this issue, to this disease, to this problem in my family, to this problem uh, at my job, to this addiction, to this habit that I won't change, say unto this, be removed, get out of my life, get away from me, I'm making a change, and trust in God. And let Him take care of the results of that. Now, that's what He said to them. Say unto this mountain. Do you have a mountain today? By faith, stand up, face it, look at it, and say unto it, Get out of my way. Get out of my sight. Get away from me. And then trust the rest of that into the hand of God. That's faith. And no matter what happens, believing that's what God wants to do. He may want you to face that mountain. He may want you to tunnel through it. He may want you to go over it. He may want you to build a road all the way around it and get through it some way. But put it in the hands of God. Now, he goes on. The disciples in Mark, they ask him that question. Matthew gives that summation there. But in Mark, he said, well, he says it also in Matthew, but he says something else to them. After he's talked about faith, the kind of faith, like a seed that's alive even when it appears to be dead, he says one final thing to them. He says, this kind, and I'm reading the part in Mark, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Now, I'm not going to get into fasting. Nothing wrong with fasting. A lot of people fast today. Any of you doing that... Uh, and I can't even think of what they call it, where you, where you don't fast for a certain number of hours, you know, and stuff like that, from maybe 6 at night till 11 the next day or noon. Uh, intermittent fast, I think is what they call it. A lot of people are doing that. There's a lot of fasting going on. There's some of us not fasting enough, but uh, you, you get the idea. So I, I, I'm not worried about the fasting. What does he mean? This kind come, can come forth by nothing or only by prayer and fasting. Now, I'm telling you, there's some things, there's some mountains, there's some problems, there's some issues in our lives that we're going to have to look deeper than what we've been used to. Uh, you know, maybe... maybe Maybe we've prayed about something or, or others are praying and, and things are not changing. There's some things. There are some things in our lives that we've got to get into the heart of God. I mean, I have no other way of explaining it other than we've got to dig into that spiritual connection with God. Prayer Fasting, whatever it takes, we've got to let the things that distract us, the things that rob our attention, the things that pull us from God, we've got to get past those things for a, a brief moment at least and get down <clears throat> to the heart of God. It ain't going to happen easy. 
It ain't going to be something that you just snap your fingers. It's not going to be you pray or I pray one time about it and wow, it's all over. As some of you know, even in your own lives and things you've experienced in the past, there's things that you have prayed about not only for hours, not just weeks, not just months, but you've prayed for years for things to happen. You've got to get down to where you are communicating spiritually with God. It's kind of like what Romans 8 talks about when it talks about the Holy Spirit making, I think the King James uses the word utterances or groanings, making these groanings, and the actual Greek word is, you, it could be translated, inarticulate expressions. What does that mean? It means when you or I cry out in such a way no one around us knows what that cry is. We ourselves don't even know what that cry is. Have you ever had that? Have you ever been to that place that you're crying out to God, you can't put it in words, you can't describe it. You can't just say, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. You know, it's not just words anymore. It's coming out from that depth of you where the real you just flows out to God. That's the Holy Spirit taking your deepest need and presenting it to God. That's what he's talking about. So, whatever you're facing, any of the things that I've listed, other things that can't be said, say unto this whatever. God is going to remove you. And if He doesn't remove you, He's going to give me the grace to fight you and to move through it and to deal with it. Say unto this mountain.